Thank you very much for having us. Okay, so I thought we would do a little bit um, kind of not as intense introductions, not necessarily related to mining peers education, but what we like about the horse industry and what we do. Uh, so myself, I am a dressage rider, but I also love to cross train. Uh, do lots of different um, disciplines with that, Western dressage, training, all sorts of different types of riding. I've uh, been involved in the Alberta horse industry for my entire life. Grew up on a boarding stable in Northwest Calgary. Um, and then Kara? Yeah, so um, I grew up in BC and started off in the Western pleasure world. Chased cans, rail race for a little bit. Um, then complete switch, went into jumper land and a little bit of three-day venting. And now I'm back into the open shows for some pleasure stuff. And um, yeah, looking to go fast again with those, those barrel ponies. So yeah, I love that both of us are not just one discipline, but have a variety of background that I think makes us not just stronger riders, but stronger clinicians. So we know when you come to us with a certain problem for either you or your horse, we have an amazing idea of what you're going through for your discipline specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll dive into it a little bit later, but we own a physiotherapy clinic in Cochrane that we uh, very excitingly are to announce that we have expanded throughout the uh, COVID situation, which is really, really good. A move was already in the um, cards for us. COVID just kind of sped up the process. Uh, so you're actually getting this from our new facility, which barely anybody has been into yet. We've only been open for a week. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a team of three physiotherapists, all of us with an interest in riding, team of three uh, massage therapists, all of them riders as well. We have a kinesiologist, we have two equine sports therapists out in the field with the horses. And we have an osteopath mm -hmm. as well. So nice, well-rounded team. Yeah, our goal is to have a multidisciplinary, holistic approach uh, to working with you as a equestrian athlete coming from all sorts of different views. We have kind of round table sessions with the therapist when we're working with the same patient to get everybody's ideas. Uh, it's a common thing that occurs in human health care. You want to have your doctor, your nutritionist, and your chiropractor and everybody chatting. And our goal is that Equus could be that place for the equestrian athlete. Yeah, to do that, for yeah. sure. Yeah, and so our eventual um, kind of dream with Equus, because it's been so successful, we didn't know what it was going to be like. We've only opened for three years. Uh, it might not have made it, but the great part is equestrians love to hurt themselves. So we feel we've made a very good business model that the equestrian athlete is never going to not need us. And we hope to, by the end of mining peers' careers, to have a equus physio in basically every major metropolitan center across Canada. You know, in the next couple of years, we hope to expand Edmonton, Saskatchewan, Kira already is working with some stuff in BC. Uh, so yeah, the proof has been in the pudding that this is what you guys as equestrians are really looking for is people who understand what you do. Yeah, for sure. That actually, you can't see it, but actually made me a little scary. Because <laughs> thinking of where we came from, honestly, considering working out of one stall um, at your family barn to where we are now is pretty amazing that we've had this support from the community and not just Cochrane and Calgary, but honestly, people from coming from all over here to... Um, yeah, have this multidisciplinary approach. Yeah, and that's why we thank the Alberta Equestrian Federation for putting on these little community engagement sessions. And COVID has allowed us to get so much more comfortable with Zoom sessions that I hope people are tuning in right now from Northern Alberta or down by the border. Stuff that people we might not ever actually get to talk to. Okay, let's dive in. Okay, so return to riding from the inside out. I'm so excited. This is like my passion. So if I get super excited and handsy, it's just because I'm really nerdy and so passionate about this topic. Okay, so our love story. So I will do this one. So Kira and I, people always ask us if we've been friends for a really long time, and we actually haven't. We met on the first day of physio school. Uh, we, you know, they kind of get you all registered and they throw 110 of us into a big um, room here at Corbett Hall. If any of you live in Edmonton, it's a beautiful old part of the UV. And they go around and they want every person to introduce themselves, where they live, and what kind of physiotherapist they want to be. And most people, you know, they, they want to work with sports. They want to be like working with NFL teams or they want to help, you know, amputees walk again, like kind of those really powerful messages. And I was the weird girl who said, I want to work with horses. 
and literally the whole room went silent because nobody ever expected that answer. And um, the dean of the program looked at me and said, you know, this is a human program, right? And I said, yes, I do. I want to know everything about humans and apply it to horses. Later on, we're taking a photo and everybody rushes to the front and then literally Kira sits down beside me and says, you can do physio on horses? <laughs> I was like, yeah. And there it kind of grew. We weren't even that good friends through, uh, through uh, the program, but we always knew that we wanted to help equestrian athletes. We always talked about the injuries that they get or what we had going on with our own riding. And that one day we would maybe open the clinic. Kira stayed in Edmonton, I came back to Calgary. And then through kind of a whole mixture of events, Kira ended up in Cochrane and we came here. So the reason why I wanted to do horses was when I was little, when I was six years old, we had a um, international level competition dressage horse that got hurt. So it was at the time one of the highest level horses in Canada and he got a hip injury. Came out of the stall one day, three-legged leg. Had Dr. Rockout, who many of you people know from Warren Company. And at the time, kind of that type of injury, there wasn't even like portable x-rays and stuff like that. So he kind of gave my mom, who's a very practical person, three options. You can throw him in a stall and hope it gets better. You can turn him out, hope it gets better, or you can use that. And she said, it's so weird. Like a month ago, I had sciatica. Like I was three-legged or one-legged lane down my leg, I had this numbness, tingling, pain, anybody who's had it, you can't put weight on your leg. She said, that's so weird that that happened to me, and then this happens to him, but the best part about me was I just went to the physio in town, and she helped me out, and I feel so much better, I can return to riding within a couple of weeks, can we do this for the horse? And he said, oh, I'm sure you can, I just, I don't know how. So she went and tracked down through that physiotherapist, one physiotherapist in Canada that had training in horses. And her name is Leslie Kerfoot, and she's a very, very dear friend to this day. Uh, she's been to many of our presentations that I love always mentioning her name. She's lovely. Yeah, so she's a UK trained physiotherapist. And anybody that comes from Europe knows that human therapists are very much integrated into the veterinary world, kind of pulling that knowledge because oftentimes human uh, healthcare is 50 years advanced over animal healthcare, right? Like the techniques, the demand is just there. And so long story short, they helped rehab the, the stallion. He never made it back to that international level of competition, but he was able to put food on my family's table because he was a breeding stallion. So we had so much money invested into this. It was literally a very emotional journey. And I was six years old. I didn't comprehend the whole thing, but kind of everybody being upset that the horse was hurt. And then this miracle lady came, they get all teary eyed, uh, to help our family out. And I remember leaving the last rehab session with that horse and staring at the passenger console and just saying, this is what I want to do. Like, I want to be a horse physiotherapist. And so that led to my whole life. I knew what I wanted to do, did the proper steps, got my kinesiology degree, and then went into physio school. And then turns out I really like working with humans. <laughs> so Karen and I actually don't do too much with horses. Our caseload of horses is maybe 10%. We really, really love working with data equestrian athletes, but we do a ton of consulting with people about how they can design equine rehab programs. Mm -hmm. And um, so if you don't know Sandra very well, she doesn't get very emotional. So <laughs> that's a big thing to have here. Um, and just one thing to add on to that is um, we also do riding clinics together where we pick apart the horse and the rider. Um, we work on you independently from your animal and then we put you back together. In 90% of the cases, the horse and the rider will have the exact same dysfunction going on. Um, like our last clinic that we did, nine out of 10 had the exact same things. The only pair that wasn't the same was the horse was neurologic. So we're not expecting that human to have a neurologic condition as well. So. Really, that just give you a little bit of a point that whatever's going on with your body, you are going to be influencing your horse because they're going to be compensating for us. It gives so. us goosebumps every time it happens, but it just keeps happening, right? A uh, horse will have a sore hip, and then the person's right hip happens to be sore as well, even if they didn't know about it. Yeah, exactly. So as you can see, we're really nerdy. We're super passionate about what we do, um, but we've already gone 15 minutes, so we'll keep on going. <laughs> we're going to go fast. Okay, so really, we kind of already um, dove into this, but what do we want to bring to the equine community is we want to bridge the medical gap between pain and recovery 
and success in the saddle for both horse and rider. So you can see why we have this model, like how it came to be, and really we're living out our dreams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, this is our mission statement of our company. Yeah. Okay, we have a um, certification in equine rehab. So after we finished our physiotherapy degree, we completed our equine rehabilitation diploma, and we actually, excitingly, in the last month, are the only, or the first two Canadian graduates. Most people had to go to the States to get their um, certification once they were physiotherapists for equine, but the Canadian system has now created its own education stream, so we're super, super excited about that. And the Animal Rehab Division advocates for um, physiotherapists that are interested in canine, equine, feline practice, and we love working with them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is physiotherapy? Um, so, a little bit boring, but let's just put it out there. So, physiotherapists combine their in-depth knowledge on the body and how it works, specialized hands-on, so a lot of hands-on, clinical skills to assess, diagnose, and treat symptoms of illness, injury, or disability. So, whenever we see you or your horse, we're asking you what's going on, you're telling us. We're putting you through a bunch of movements, checking your strength, doing some specialized tests, diagnosing you, and then coming up with a treatment plan, treatment, and then also um, therapeutic exercise as well. Mm -hmm. So on that note, therapeutic exercise to us, honestly, is one of the Bread most- butter. Yeah, it's like one of the most important things. So I know a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to do exercises, but really, if you don't do those, you're not gonna get to the next step. So whether or not that means your ankle's not gonna get to the point where you feel super stable in that stirrup or your ankle's limiting you from getting to that next level of riding, all of that really can be addressed um, from therapeutic exercise. So really, we say you are the athlete, we're just the coach. Can't so, do it for you. <laughs> so we will give you all of those tool tools to get you to that next step, but then we put that, put it everything into your hands and we kind of go from there. That's one of our biggest pushes is that a majority of what you need to do to get better is this therapeutic exercise. And we say therapeutic specifically because it's designed for your injury, your dysfunction, your goals, right? We took a lot of thought and effort to put it together. It's not just like Googling some, you know, generic exercises on the internet to get your shoulder better. Mm -hmm. Okay, so inside out. Nerdy. Okay, so what does that mean? So I want you guys to raise your hands, that little button down there on the bottom, or I want you to go into the chat and put down what you think inside out means. What do you think that we are going to touch on? So interactive Zoom session. Interactive Zoom session. Okay, some responses coming in. I love it. <laughs> Look, all the hands are up. Woo! <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Okay, oh my God, yes, so excited. This is our lovely team, by the way, and as you can tell, um, we love to have fun at work, so as those are coming in. Okay, so the pelvic floor and core. So honestly, I love this. I don't know why I'm so into the pelvic floor and core, but that is what we are going to base today's session on, and Honestly, if this is not working properly, I guarantee you, you're going to be not sitting in that saddle properly. You're gonna be having other dysfunctions like low back pain and other things that we're going to go into. So um, yeah, Let's your wonky ankle on the left that your coach keeps telling you to turn your toe in, it actually is just coming from your pelvic floor and your core. <laughs> so, okay, so what is the pelvic floor? So really it's comprised of four basic things. So the diaphragm up there on that top left. So the diaphragm is, let me back up. You have your rib cage, it's at the top of the ribs, okay? And as you inhale, it goes down. As you exhale, it goes up. If this diaphragm is not able to mobilize properly, your pelvic floor, which is down here, so the pelvic floor muscles, they're not able to move very well. Pelvic floor muscles, they're a group of muscles just like your quad, but if you cannot move that diaphragm, you're not gonna be able to move your pelvic floor. So it attaches to the pubic bone and then goes right back to the tailbone. And then up on the top, we have the abdominal cavity. And really that, uh, from the diaphragm down to the pelvic floor, it's all of that in there. And then we have your core, which I like to think I'm funny, I might not be, but core being all of your abdominal muscles. So there's four main muscles. And the one we're gonna touch on today is transverse abdominis. The other ones, rectus abdominis and your obliques, they'll look really good. 
good, they're sexy muscles, but let's be honest, they don't really do anything. And the TA is really like the spanks so that keeps everything in. Anything bad on that? No. Oh. Okay, so your pelvic floor um, can be either too tight, it can be normal, or it can be too weak. So there's a range of, like any muscle, how it can be functioning. So a weak pelvic floor, so let's just take a bicep curl, where I would normally do this. Um, just that up a little bit for you. So if I was to do bicep curl, a weak would be, oh, I can't lift that up at all. So just too weak that I literally can't move that. A tight one would be I'm up here and I literally can't move it down. So that is all that I have to make my movement out of it. And then a normal one would be being able to move well enough. So weak, minimal muscle tone, general weakness. Tight, increased muscle tone, and you cannot disengage it. So really, it's like you're walking around like this all day long, and tight, and you go to cough or sneeze, and you just can't hold anything in, okay? So it's the inner, inner synergy of all of that together and how it works. Okay, so hypertonic, tight, actually means weak, okay? I know it's a little bit of a mind flip flop. You're like, well, that doesn't really make sense. The tight muscle. But I'm not strong here. I can't lift much here. I have to be able to relax and go all the way through. So hypertonic muscles, pelvic floor muscles, um, and I think one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about this is it's so common in us riders. Um, like super, super, super common. So we can have a tight pelvic floor. We have high tone, hypertonicity. Um, it's hard for us to release that pelvic floor down. So we're like this and we're like trying to relax and we can't. It's because they're type A. <laughs> that is right. So, <laughs> dyspareunia is a fancy word for painful intercourse. Um, I know it can be a um, hard topic for some people to talk about. I'm super open. If you ever see me somewhere, please come and ask me. Um, frequent voiding, so you gotta go pee a lot. Right before you get in the tax. Hold my horse! I gotta go! Yeah, or you do like your first loop around the arena and you're like, oh, I actually have to go pee. So you get on again. And then pain during riding. So I'll be honest, this was one for me where I was like, why does my butt hurt while I'm riding? Well, it's because my pelvic floor was so tight and I wasn't releasing it during riding. And this is not just females, FYI. No, definitely had, um, yeah, males as well, for sure. Okay, so some common things, again, would be that frequent urination and unstable core, okay? So during riding. Who, the, oh, let's use, the, let's use the function again. Oh, who has a good core? Come on, raise your hands up. Raise your hands up if you think you have a really strong core. Not many, not many of us are coming in. Especially coming out of COVID. Oh yeah, as we're sitting more, for sure. COVID-15? Quarantine 15. Quarantine 15. Okay, so some common dysfunctions that we can see with the pelvic floor um, and riding. So one, that frequent urination. Two, you have an unstable core, which meaning it's just not strong. You have an anterior pelvic tilt. So I'm just gonna get Sandra to demonstrate that. So see how she's kind of broken right here and then go into more neutral pelvis for me. And here she's a little bit more straight. So her core is engaged, allowing her not to hang Inability to diaphragmatically breathe. So remember I said that diaphragm sits at the bottom of that rib cage. If that diaphragm is not able to mobilize up and down, pelvic floor is not going to be good. So we need to be able to do that. Pain. Pain during intercourse, pain during riding, pain post riding, all of that. Um, pain during intercourse, leakage, 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 leakage. And that can be urinary or fecal, um, either during riding or running or all of that. Going over a jump. When yeah. the horse scoops, yeah. um, a sliding stop, a spin, all of that stuff. Um, and then that common leaning forward while riding. So is that one of the things that your coach is constantly telling you to do is like, hey, pull your shoulders back. But meanwhile, you have your shoulders back, but the problem is not coming from up here, but it's coming from down below. Okay. So the neutral pelvis. Oh, I'm so all about the neutral pelvis. So looking from this position, on the, obviously it's from the photo, but looking from the back. So you want a neutral pelvis is really where your pelvis is going to be in the middle of all the way going forward and all the way going backwards. So Sandra's just gonna demonstrate that there. Now, she's cheating a little bit because she's also moving her shoulders, right? It's trying to get that middle part. So 
That's the front and back, and then we also have the side to side. So neutral pelvis, we want you to have equal weight in both of your sit bones. So those are your bones down here, right at the bottom, um, where you're sitting on your saddle. And this neutral pelvis really is going to give us an optimal positioning when you're riding, and it's also going to increase your pelvic floor strength. So as you know, um, the pelvic floor attaches to the pubic bone, right in front, hear that bone, and then attaches to the tailbone. So you want that, that little sling sling to be right in the middle. You don't want it to be too far back. All your important cords. Yes. So nothing falls out. <laughs> okay. So next. So how do we get all the way to, from the front and the back? Okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to go pelvic tilt. So you're going to go all the way forward, all the way back, all the way forward. Now Sandra's cheating, so she's not allowed to move from her shoulders. Okay. Now you're going to find that mid position. Now, lots of times riders tend to hinge in their low back here, so they go too far forward. So I almost want you to think about leaning back a little bit more as if, and my cue really is, I want you to be high on a tree, be low on a tree. Be high on a tree, be low on a tree. Everyone laughs when I say that, but really, it is like the best cue. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you again. There's her neutral, okay? So she's right in the mid between forward and back. Now the next part to get to the neutral pelvis is to have equal weights from side to side. So, Sandra's gonna take her thumbs and she's gonna hook them underneath her ribs. Okay, there you go. Sandra's learning where her ribs are. <laughs> so, and then she's gonna take her index finger and she's gonna put them on her model hip bone. Maybe just turn around for us. Okay. So, and then our fingertips on her model hip bones, that pointy part. Now what I want you to do is see whether or not walk from side to side, whether or not they're equal. So she's gonna exaggerate for us a little bit. So right now she's collapsed a little bit on this right hand side. So she needs to lift up her rib cage on the right foot. And then she feels like she's equal from side to side. Take your fingers off and put them together and see if that space Okay. And you might feel like on your like, yeah, I feel totally neutral. I got equal weight in both of my butt bones. But when you take your fingertips together, you want to make sure they're exactly the same. One isn't just slightly smaller because that's really going to you be compressed on one side and then a little bit looser on the other side. And you know who's going to tell you? Your horse. Right? Can't pick up the one, can't leave one way. Can't do a blind change one way. All that is about that seat bone weight distribution. Exactly. Okay, so that is something great is to start off with that neutral pelvis. Okay, another exercise I would like you guys to do is pelvic tilts. Try it right now in your chairs. Yes. Rolly stools are great off the chairs. So, so pelvic tilts not only get you to that neutral pelvis, but also make sure that your low back, your lumbar spine is able to mobilize and move because this is what's happening when you're riding. So Okay, so Sandra is going to come all the way forward and all the way back, keeping this equal. Now, yeah, so her going back is quite good. Watch her closely when she goes forward, she shakes. So go back, forward, shake, shake, shake. And you can see it because the stool is actually moving. So really this position is what you should be doing when you're riding, right? You shouldn't be, yeah, I'm good, I got my planter, I'm sitting trot, because then you look like a chicken. So if you're able to mobilize from your low back, your horse will be so much happier with you, you're going to be better overall positioning. So, and you want, this is a great thing, you want it to be fully smooth going forwards and fully smooth going backwards. You also want each side to feel like they're going forward and back the exact same amount. So just really kind of tuning into your body, like, yeah, my right hip is going just as far forward as my left. Yeah, I always feel my right side goes forward, and I feel there's a little bit of a relation to being right-handed. Yeah, okay. So this is to do one while riding, two, grab your saddle stand, bring it home and practice while you're at home on a ball. Um, one of those big physio balls is great, because it really gives you a good feedback for your session, feeling a body in space of what you're doing. Oh. So, household hacks. So this is something I've really keyed in on during the whole COVID quarantine. And I might give you a little bit too much info, but I'm super open. So, 
when we do our exercises or we're trying to, I'm going to even back up. We ride, let's say five times a week for one hour. So that's five hours out of the week that we're trying to change our position. We need to get more optimal positioning off the saddle so that we are in the best possible biomechanics when we're on there. So if you can practice these things at home during like times that you're not even thinking about it, i.e. the dinner table. Okay, how are you sitting? Are you always leaning on one elbow? Do your, do your pelvic tilts, find your neutral pelvis and sit there and eat in that position. Your horse is gonna love you, okay? Toileting, I know this probably sounds so funky, but I've been having, so I drink a lift for whatever reason, I realize that when I go to get up off the toilet, I always bring my right leg back and then I sit like that. So this leg is always back, this one's always forward. Well, by doing that, I'm using my right leg more to get up off the toilet. So, and my right lead is actually always my weakest, bringing this left leg back. So, how me at home showing where my dysfunction is also is like, oh, I should be working on this at home to get that pantry better. So, now I'm focusing on whenever I'm getting up from the toilet, from a chair, from my desk, getting up with equal, my feet being equal, and trying to get up straight. Okay? Just try it now. Do one little stand up and see where do you want to put your weight. Yeah. And you always got to do the opposite. Is there one leg that always goes forward? Is there one leg that always goes back? Okay. So showing us where your asymmetries are. Driving is another great oh. one. Their right. driving position is terrible. You spend an hour driving to the barn, right? Because it's all far away. Especially if you drive standard. Oh my gosh, it's so asymmetrical. And then you get on your horse and you expect to be symmetrical. You have to be aware of that in the driver's yeah. seat. Are you always Our leaning on that console? Is it like this? So if you're always leaning on that console, look at what's gonna be happening. You're shortening here and lengthening here. Not good, because that's how I'm gonna be when I get to the barn. Oh, okay. We always say driving is a waste of time because you're not really doing anything. You can do so many directions when you're driving. Yeah. Okay, so multitask. Um, this top photo actually was really me working at home and I, I wasn't able to ride, so I got my barrel saddle out. That's not even a saddle stand. That, a bar stool. that is a bar stool that I just threw up so my legs could hang. And I honestly worked on my positioning um, while I was at home. Yeah, if you have an extra saddle laying around, kind of rig up a system like this that you can spend another 10 minutes in the tack and really focus. Exactly. Because once you're on a horse, right, you're always thinking about the horse and correcting the horse. You actually have to take some time in the saddle to look at you and break it down. Exactly. So add a few of these things into like your desk at home, if you're back at to work or all of this. So um, saddle stand, a physio ball like this guy down here. Great way to see, does your ball gonna kind of go out to the side instead of being right in the middle? The couch, how are you sitting on the couch? And I want you to stand up, like Sandra said, the wrong way. But do it so it's awkward so you're working on your weak side. That is a therapeutic exercise where you're working on a dysfunction. Mm -hmm. We always say that the exercises we give you should feel weird and not correct. That's the point. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so diaphragmatic breathing. So Sandra's going to demonstrate this one for us. So again, remember if your diaphragm is not moving, your pelvic floor isn't going to move. So she's gonna put one hand on her chest, one hand on her belly. So when she inhales, her lungs are going to expand. Her diaphragm is going to come down and then helping her pelvic floor relax. So again, okay, you see how she's breathing mostly from the top of her lungs here? So it's called apical breathing and it's super, super, super common. And for the type A people, people who are a little bit more tight, hypertonic, the diaphragm rack can be really hard. So this hand on her chest is not going to move. So I only want her belly to move out. So inhale, belly rises. So she even is trying really hard this time. The chest even moves a little bit. Inhale, belly rises. Exhale, belly falls. Inhale, belly rises. Exhale, belly falls. So this is a great, great, great exercise. One to do to say, okay, when I do a diaphragmatic breath, which also is going to inadvertently make my pelvic floor better, um, it's something good if you're going, right before you're gonna do a barrel run, right before you go do your dressage test, that in the show jumping ring, 
reset everything. It really calms down our sympathetic nervous system, right? Our fight or flight. So if you're even a little bit nervous to ride or things like that, that can be a huge piece to calm down the nervous system. Exactly. So this honestly is like one of my favorite exercises. And it's so hard. <laughs> it seems like it should be easy. Um, and it's also a great one if you can't fall asleep at night to do this guy. Focus on your bed. Exactly. Okay. So we talked a little bit about that, we didn't say lower cross syndrome, but this is what we're kind of going towards. It's what we call a lot of the dysfunctions in the lower body where people don't actually have pain or injury, but they want to improve their riding. We call it lower cross syndrome. Yeah. Right? So Kira can explain that a little bit. So lower cross syndrome, and especially because we've been sitting a little bit more, it's where we have weaker where we have weaker glutes, or glutes, here's where the glutes are. You have a weaker core, so TA. You have weaker glutes back here. You have tight hamstrings, which equestrians actually tend to pull or tear quite often because we're gripping there inappropriately. And then we also get really tight hip flexors. So it makes us be in a more of a stance like this, and why we want to move back here instead of all the way underneath. Okay, so it also makes us go like this, get our forces on our forehand a little bit more. And we always say to riders, it's almost a little bit of downside to our sport is most of us sit all day and then we sit in the car and then we have a sport where we sit. It's actually good when you cross train with like skiing or racket sports where you're not in this lower cross position. I'm so short, I have back up. This lower cross position all the time. So make sure you are doing other sports to get you out of that. Exactly. So this hamstring stretch is a great one to do after riding. Here I'm doing it on a mounting block. So really make sure that your back is flat when you go forward, okay? So I'm not trying to stretch kind of like this. My leg is up and I'm going straight forward back. You should have a nice pull here, maybe even into your calf mm -hmm. as well. Um, and your toes are pointed towards you, so just like you always want to feel down. And a question we get a lot of the time is, should I be doing these stretches before I get on the horse? And so a lot of you know that you shouldn't statically stretch, right? So you shouldn't pull the stretch like this before you go to perform. But the good part about riding is chances are you walked out in the field, you got the horse stacked on, you did a couple of laps in the arena, you actually already are warm. So we are okay with you doing some static stretching before you get on, but then most definitely doing it when you get off is the most beneficial. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, I swear, guys. Okay, so hip flexor. We always have tight hip flexors. So that is a muscle that really runs right here. Quite a lot, quite lots of us when we're in the saddle, we are using our hip flexors to pull ourselves forward, putting us in that anterior pelvic tilt, shoulder back, but I'm doing it and I look like I'm the Eddie the Eagle, like flying with the thing, going like this on my horse, instead of being tucked under. So really tight hip flexors, we want to stretch this guy out. So we can use your glutes to push ourselves forward and not our hip flexors. So as you can see in this, the most common mistake with this one is people are like, oh, I really can't feel anything, but they're like arching from their back and not here. So it's really not that big of a step. Keep high on that tree and kind of go down the elevator and you should feel a nice little stretch right here. Right. A lot of people that have trouble um, feeling kind of one with their horse, like they almost are always being pushed out of the tack or going with the horse, have tight hip flexors, and they're driving you out of the saddle. Mm -hmm. Okay, so T8, innermost abdominal muscle. It is the spanx of the abs. It is a very thin little muscle, but it goes from um, the ribs down to the pubic bone and wraps around. Look it is horse thin. Yeah. Um, it is my favorite. So what I would like you to do, TA, take your two index fingers, put it on the inside of your model hip bones. Inside your model hip bones. Good. Okay. Now what you're going to try to do is you're going to try and engage TA without any of the other three muscles, um, abdominal muscles, turning on. So stand so your fingers to sit down. She's in her neutral pelvis. Back a little bit. Good. She's going to try and engage this lower part so between her two hip bones and try to make her two hip bones come closer together. Good. And you can see that her fingertips went in a little bit. Okay. There. It is a light pressure on your, on your hands. So if you feel it, it's like, it's going on. It's going on too, too much. It's wrong. 
Think of it in an analogy of, okay, I want to have my horse go from a walk to a trot. You want them to go smoothly in it. You don't want them to just, yeah, throw on, throw on the gas and the gallop away. So that's what you're trying to do. So you should feel a light little pressure up and then back down. You're trying to make this smaller. The other thing you can think about is bringing the belly button down towards the spine. But I don't want rectus coming on. I don't want your obliques. I don't want your glutes to fire. I don't want your pelvic floor to fire. This is a really hard exercise. Um, because it's deep. So deep, yeah. But definitely something we can help you out with. And I highly, 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 highly encourage you to get this to turn on. It's also, if we have a little bump down below, it's because our TA is on the edge. Okay? And that allows us to go into that anterior pelvic tilt. Okay, so the Kegel, <laughs> the classic Kegel. Classic Kegel from Dr. Kegel himself. So the pelvic floor, like I said, is that sling. Pelvic floor not only squeezes, but it squeezes and lifts and then drops. So for us riders, that drop is even more of the more important part because we want it to be in a relaxed tone or a neutral tone for when we go to do things. So what I would like you to do is, I would like you to try and squeeze, mm -hmm. lift, and then drop. So I'm just gonna try. Can't and perfect, anything. she can't see anything. So your other half, your friends, your mom, your dad, whoever, should be able to look at you and your eyeballs aren't going up and down, your mouth aren't flaring, your toes aren't crunching, and no one is able to tell what you're doing with your pelvic floor. And you're keeping And you're able to keep all. So um, this is something I can go into so, 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 so much in depth with you. And there's so many different exercises. Um, but the pelvic floor squeeze, lift, and drop um, is so key. So I'm going to give you one little hack. Is that Sandra is going to lean forward so her elbows are onto her knees. She's going to have increased proprioception, feeling of her body and face. So here, I want her to think about stopping P. So stop P, stop P, stop P, and you should feel a little squeeze. Now think about stopping gas. <laughs> and now think about just kegeling. So one of those three positions is going to feel better. She's gonna have more movement. And really, I want you just to stick with that cue that cue for you to do it because you're having a better neural connection from your brain to your pelvic floor. You're not moving any of different muscles, okay? It's just like when you go to move your quad, you're moving the whole thing, you're not deciding this is with the MO, they're working together. So try one of those three cues, leaning forward so you're getting increased pressure, feeling there, and then go with that. Go with that too, right? Yeah. Okay, gang gangster mode, like you're driving a car, okay? And which one do you feel the most? And then you kind of go with that cue. Okay, so riding, why is this important? So we want to make sure that we have that neutral pelvis. So we gave you the tips and tricks on how to do that. We want you to diaphragmatically breathe. Sorry, you can only sing half and half. So we want to be able to diaphragmatically breathe. So try that while you're riding. Do your 20 meter circle. Do your canter circles, your trot. And breathe into your belly. Breathe. breathe. Feel, feel the diaphragm going up and down, up and down. And I challenge you, and send us an email, write us on Facebook, what did your horse do when you finally diaphragmatically breathe? So they're gonna love you. Like, lick their lips, do that whole thing, okay? I engage you to engage your transverse abdominis while you're riding, okay? Make sure you can feel that engage, and then back down. Oh, like it's really an activation of the lower abdominals. Exactly, okay? And then I also challenge you to do some Kegels while you're riding, but, that drop I should have like highlighted in bold and put in red. So I want you to go down, do your slide and stop. So okay, I'm gonna do a slide and stop, Kegel, engage, drop. I'm gonna go over that jump. Kegel, jump, drop down, okay? Most of us just think about doing the Kegel action, right? Like doing the contraction and then we just let it go. And we don't think about that part, but because riders are, tend to be more type A, more hypertonic, height, pelvic floor like Kira was saying, it's so important to concentrate on the release. Yeah, and it's actually gonna make you stronger because you're gonna have more movement, more range of that, of that whole muscle. Okay, so this is something that the equestrian community has begged and pleaded for me to do, or for us to do for a, a while. Yeah. And I honestly didn't have the time, but COVID, thank COVID. you very much. There's been lots of positives out of it. 
I now, we now have this online pelvic floor seminar. It's so, in like people from Belgium, from Australia, all around the world bought this program throughout COVID. And we're so excited that riders can now have help with their pelvic floor. Exactly. So it's online, it's self-directed. Um, directed, sorry. So there's a lecture component, and honestly, what I gave you here is just like no, just the words. it's kind of like when someone butters your toast and they didn't really put anything on it. So <laughs> really, I'll give you a nice smothered and buttered piece of toast. <laughs> so, so and there's a pelvic floor lecture, um, and then there are individual exercises for um, all the exercises that I go over. Um, and then there's a 45 minute exercise session that's broken up into chunks for you to put together a whole pelvic floor and core exercise class for yourself to do at home. Um, and then with this is full access for one month and bonus. Um, you're able to claim with your extended health benefits and you can't do that, you can do any taxes at the end of the year. Yeah, I have to tell Kira, I didn't even tell her this, this morning I had a patient that has bought this program and see treating them for a different injury and they wanted to do the pelvic floor thing. And she said, one session of Kira's exercises on her own. She was already peeing less when she was riding. She actually has been wearing things while she's riding and she could not believe it. It literally was just her awareness of that that has already helped. And she was so excited. Oh, that's so good. I honestly, I love my job. And when I hear things like that, you I'm can like, change one person. Ugh, if I can change one person from not wetting your pants or like not having to wear black breeches and they're able to wear tan breeches, it's like it's huge. It's huge. It's and that's why we talk that. about this so casually. Sometimes people are a little bit put back by how casual we are with it. We want this to just be okay because chances are pretty much every other person at the barn is having some sort of trouble. Yeah. So that's the reality. Exactly. So let's help you. So I'm just going to go through that a little bit. Um, you can find it on equisphysio.com. Um, our website is constantly a work in progress. So it's a little bit under construction, unfortunately, right yeah. now. Yeah. But lots of blogs and stuff up there recently, which has been great. So you can go to the classes tab and then click on the pelvic floor. It kind of goes through everything, clicks on the pelvic floor. And then there is two options there. Um, the regular, which is a little bit more just in depth into the pelvic floor dysfunctions and um, just focus a little bit more on that, I would say. Yeah, lots for like new moms, it's very in depth. Yeah, and then there's one focused more on like equestrian stuff. Um, so you can choose one of those and then um, it'll prompt us and we'll we'll send it all out to you. Yeah, it comes in some fancy exercise software. Exactly. And really it's only $60, which if you think about it, it for a whole month of that is two really exercise cheap. classes, right? That's two yoga classes and none of that stuff is open right now. Yeah, exactly. So just want to put that out there. Um, so this is where you can find all of our info, equisphysio.com. There is our email address where you can get a hold of us. There is our phone number. Honestly, our phone has been ringing off the hook. So thank you so much for being such a supportive yeah, community. And then please follow us on our social media. Um, so these are both of our tags. So Facebook, we just have the Equus Physio account. If you're into the pelvic floor stuff, it's Lady Biz Fizz. Um, and then also we have Equus Physio. I do apologize. I haven't posted much on Lady Biz Fizz lately, but we've had a lot going on with the move mm -hmm. and all of that. So, want to open it up and see if you have any questions, and yeah. Um, okay, so um, the first question that we have is from Kate, um, and Kate is actually asking, what are some exercises that I can give to my horse to improve his mobility? Mm -hmm. I think one of the good things is you, the AEF has Tina's session coming up too, right, in a couple of weeks, and its focus is on the equine. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to give you one right now. So Sandra's going to be my horse. She's going to go on all fours. What? <laughs> this is okay. Okay. okay, so she's going to go on all fours. So you know how we did? She, she, she's really bummed by it. She's like a two year old. Um, so we did that pelvic tilt for us, right? So this is your horse's back, and then this is kind of where the saddle is, and then our hamstrings. Take your hands like this, and those nice little lines on either side of your horse's butt. I want you to kind of run the hole along there, and the horse is going to tip up. So run, and then see to do a little pelvic tilt. <laughs> okay, little pelvic tilt. Good. And then, just like TA, we wanted that was so important. So let's just do a couple of belly lifts. So you're gonna go along her girth, which is equivalent where your raw line is, and you're gonna just kind of tick up, and she's gonna lift up. You can do one mid abdomen there, and then one more towards her flank and getting her to lift up. And see how she was Sandra was like lightly lifting up and then lightly going down. 
That's exactly what you want. Same exact thing as the TA. Yeah, not really up and down where they're like almost like flinching away from you. So those are like four really good easy exercises. And um, Sandra's our good little horse model. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'm going to unmute the line for Leslie. Um, she has our second question for today. So one second here. Hi, Leslie, can you hear us? Yes. Go ahead with your question, please. If you know which hip is sitting higher, like when you've done all those exercises, how do you go about extending that? It's my left side. How do you go? Is it stretches that are going to re alleviate that shorter side? It's a little bit of a loaded question for sure because it can be so many things. I would say the generic <laughs> answer would be yes, they, like a QL stretch. Do you want to show them? So is she, so QL quadratus lumboris sits in here. So quite often it gets really, really, really tight. Um, and actually can for a lot of like back pain. So I'm just trying to come off standard. Yeah. So really even one would be like bring this arm up and then stretch over. So you're trying not to collapse here. You're trying to like lift up and over and stretch this part. Um, so this would be a really easy one just to kind of stretch that. Um, another one would be okay. so you're going to literally go up. So she's I don't know. Can you see that her legs are crossed there? Tuck the left. Yes. Right. So the side that you're tuck, the side that you're stretching, you're going to tuck that leg behind, and then you're going to move away, move away from that. So in this one, you have to play with a little bit, like Sandra's leaning a little bit more forward. Some people have to go back. You all can be quite hard to get to, but that's a great one. Just it to start is, with. It honestly is a short, little, stubborn, hard muscle to get to. Um, but even just doing that opening, you're getting to. And that's why it's a loaded question. All of the muscles that attach to that area. And so wherever you feel it is where it needs to stretch. Exactly. Um, and usually I'm also going to guess that your hip flexor is also super, super tight on that side. You probably have a weakness somewhere and that's why QL is over, overstimulated. Yeah. And then just do that kind of analysis of how you sit throughout the day or what your, what your job is. Do you have a really asymmetrical job as compared to like a very symmetrical typing job? Yeah. Those type of things are so important to look at how we operate in the tack, the yeah. surface area in the tack. Yeah. Even so, I'm just going to add one more in there, Leslie. So, like when I normally, so I said I was always doing this leg. Usually, when I normally stand, yeah. I do this. So I hip pop, just like if my horse was going to like rest. So it means that I'm not relying on any of my muscles, but I'm just simply this joint to hold me, and that's going to make this. Compared to that, can you see that difference there? Mm -hmm. So really by me, even just trying to stand straighter, I'm engaging. Yeah, or even like a lot of people only hang on one hip, make yourself hang on the other hip, it feels so weird. So you can see I'm not even able to go as far on that side as that. And it's hard, we do this just like the horse, like Kira said, because it's an efficient way to stand. It doesn't require a lot of muscle energy, so we do it. Yeah. Hope that answered your question. Okay. Yeah, Thank it did. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leslie. Love it. Um, questions coming. <laughs> uh, so the next question is from Karen. She says, do you ever find professional trainers are afraid to change their riding position and style for fear of horses moving differently or having poor show results? And how do you approach that? Bang on. Bang on. Way to hit that nail on the head. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that we are always conscientious of. So if we go to do a riding clinic, we love to have the trainer's input as well. Um, Sandra and I always say, if you don't leave one of our lessons kind of being like, I'm not sure lesson, but one of our treatments being wide-eyed and be like, what did they just say? This feels so funky. We haven't changed enough. Um, so yes, that is always, that is always a fear and it's, you know, we just try and educate first that that is going to happen, that is normal, because I think when people don't get filled in, that stuff is going to get worse before it gets better. Then they get worried and kind of get their hackles up. But we yeah, always try and integrate the trainers on changing their students and therefore then changing themselves. And really, if you want to be the best coach and the best trainer, you have to be flexible and adaptable. 
Yeah, and it's all we all get better. Exactly. So I think it's really it's just being open and um, and knowing sometimes it's kind of like doing a push up or a sit up properly, like TA properly. Like if you're gonna do that, it's going to take you a little bit longer to get to where you are than if you were just to kind of like throw yourself through it. So even just being able to take that time commitment as well and knowing that it's a mm -hmm. long game and not the short one that you're playing. Yeah, and there's so many layers to it, like any professional athlete, right? Like your coaches and your trainers, they, this is what they do for a living. They ride multiple horses a day. Actually are harder to change sometimes than, you know, us that just ride kind of Friday, Saturday. That those motor patterns, like the brain to nerve to muscle, aren't as laid in stone. So they oftentimes take more to change, which then they can see as offensive because they're good at what they do, but it's just because they're so, like they practice perfectly and it just takes time and that's okay. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, I don't really know if that answered, or maybe in a roundabout way. <laughs> Thanks, ladies. Um, our next question is from Kate. She says, do you have any exercises that would be good for a rider that has scoliosis and back problems? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so one that's going to deter determine wh where is that, that scoliosis. Um, is it in your lumbar spine? Is it in your thoracic? How, how bad are the degrees of movement too? Mm -hmm. um, those ballerina stretches that we gave you there or the yeah. QL stretches, those are perfect. So to whatever side um, you are tighter yeah. on, your, your curve is too, to do those. Um, that, the, the, that pelvic tilt, so if you, right, if you're curved to one side, so being really cognizant on the other side, is it going just as far forward and just as far back? The neutral pelvis is super, super important that TA is one I would give you. Um, but it also depends on the degree of how bad your scoliosis is. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we always tell our scoliosis patients or other um, kind of anatomical issues that physio is not gonna necessarily change your bone structure, right? So then we really do target the soft tissues and you may never get perfectly symmetrical and we're not gonna obsess with that, right? We love symmetry, and that's a big thing that comes with Equus Physio, but we also work within your abilities. And same thing with horses. There are horses that have, un there are lots of humans that have undiagnosed scoliosis that they don't even know about, and they are adaptable. You just have to make sure that those muscles that are tight aren't overworked for a very chronic period of time. You have to find your limits to the flexibility on the convex side. So the side that the spine is not curved to, and then really get some elasticity on the curved side. Exactly. Yeah. Then showing how much of a nerve she is too. <laughs> um, excellent. Um, so our next question is from Catherine. Um, she says, is it possible to rehab an old injury? Um, for example, a torn MCL or any exercises that you have uh, to help? Mm -hmm. MCL, so right off the bat, I'm going to say probably your VMO, your vastus medialis obliquus, your inside of your knee, inside knee muscle, that one is probably super, super, super weak, your quad, your whole probably diameter of your quad on that side is really weak, um, so that and your glute strength is going to be super important to get that knee, so I'm going to go back, so let's go back to like McDavid when he like tore his knee, he didn't end up having surgery because he rehabbed and made his knee, his quad muscles, his glutes so strong that they acted as the ligaments. Exactly. So really that's what you need to do is you need to get your quad so strong and your glutes so strong. And I say glutes simply because when your glutes are strong, they allow your leg to go forward and back in a good positioning rather than your knee coming in a little bit more and not having optimal positioning at this, at this knee. So you need to, and when I say glutes, really all of this. So, yeah. Um, but I think if we went through all of the quad and um, glutes, glutes yeah, those stuff, would be your targets. targets. Yeah. But I'm I'm gonna throw out that that um, that exercise, that 45 minute exercise session in the pelvic floor seminar has an amazing glute segment that would be so good to help with that MCL injury. Yeah, oftentimes the glutes are overlooked at how important they are to me while we can. Yeah, so important. So, yeah, I would honestly direct you right to there. Yeah, 
The other thing we didn't dive into it at all is there are modalities to help with really chronic injuries because there are like people that come in and they say, you know, I've had this unstable MCL for 15 years. I don't really think you're going to be able to help with exercise because I've done all the stuff. Sometimes you just need a little bit of a Kickstarter. So if there's anyone in your area, like a physio or a chiro that has a shockwave machine, I'm sure lots of you have been exposed to a shockwave um, with equines. But what it does is it actually re-irritates tissue because after a certain period of time, our body doesn't try and heal things anymore. It gives up. So you actually need to recreate an inflammatory response for the body to carry again to restart those stages of acute, subacute, and chronic, trying to avoid going into chronic for the injury. And shockwave is the number kind of the number one thing mm -hmm. that we use. Yeah, we've had great success yeah. with our Some people we use laser. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. There's lots of modality options as well if you feel like, oh, I've gone down the exercise train and chances are you just needed to tweak the exercise a little bit, but there are those other options. Yeah. And then we also have muscle stim as well that we can put onto those specific muscles, specifically BMO, exactly. to, get, to get that quad muscle to engage so it's working properly to help stabilize while well, you do the exercise. Lot, lots we could do actually. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like Coralie actually has a question here. She said, in horses, how long after a wound should you wait for physio? Mm. So in the hospital, wounds are treated right away by physio instantly, especially laser. Laser is a huge thing. It always depends on like what is in the wound, how did the wound happen, like all those types of things. But Right away, you can do some laser, some taping. Uh, and then one of the things that is a problem with wounds, we all know this, when the wound crosses a joint in a horse, they just, they keep opening it and opening it. So we actually then make sure we really treat the uh, proximal, the like closer, closer, thank you, closer joint to the body and the further away joint. Because if you keep the joints above and below healthy, it'll take the pressure off the, the one where the wound is. Yeah. Um, I am going to add in that though, obviously, like if it's a really bad injury and your horse needs stitches and yep. um, antibiotics, you're always going to your vet first. Mm -hmm. um, we also want to make sure that it's like, hey, I want to do laser or, or whatever with Equus Physio, that we also always have that vet approval the mm -hmm. record. So everyone's working as a team. Um, but yeah, we can be out there. One of our, my sayings is day one dangles. So we can be out there day one with you. Um, that kind of leads us into our other question from Karen. She asked about if you guys treat horses at all as well. Yes, we do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we both have our equine diploma from the Canadian Physiotherapy Association. We, try, we, we don't do a ton of horses, mostly because Karen and I are so busy in the clinic. Um, so we have equine sports therapists that are like our massage therapists. Usually what we do is we consult, we go out on the first appointment, do the assessment, determine the equine rehab exercises, and then they can follow up. So they'll do a massage and tell us, okay, this was tight, that was weak based upon the injury, and then we dictate the exercises from there. Exactly. Yeah, it's still, it's a team approach. Yeah. And our two um, equine team members, um, they also have laser, they have therapeutic ultrasound, ultrasound K-taping, they're doing therapeutic cupping, cupping. Yeah. Um, they have uh, infrared lumen thing mm -hmm. as well. Um, and we also have our hands bow products as well to aid yes. and help with muscles. And we have people who live in like Northern BC and the Yukon and they want to work with us, but obviously it's not feasible for us to come up there. So we do t tons of online consults, even before Zoom or COVID happened with all the Zoom stuff, we were consulting on many cases across the country of like, you know, my vet said this, I just want a couple of ideas because it's three hours from the vet. Yeah. So that's another option. And they're super reasonable. Yeah. It's $50 for 45 minutes. Exactly. Hey, thank you so much for joining us today. And again, a big thank you to Kira and Sandra and the Equus team. Um, we really appreciate it. And again, thank you so much for joining us. And we hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you.